So welcome back to the Neverman channel. This is SV Boney's new 122 millimeter triplet. This is serial number one scope. So it's the, it's the prototype, the very first one ever made. And I got the privilege of taking it to Cherry Springs, which is a nice Bortle II sky. And I got to use it and also share the views with some very advanced visual astronomers who really know a lot more about visual astronomy than I do. They showed me a bunch of different things to test a scope like this with and this video is going to be basically my impressions that I got from putting this guy through the ropes. One of the hardest targets to test a scope for chromatic aberrations is Venus and for good reason it's really really bright and if you can see any color on Venus then you're going to see you know those chromatic aberrations are going to jump out at you and that's what I tested the scope on first and I gotta say it passed that test now there was one little mistake that I had made the day before I had been kind of reconfiguring this thing a couple times one time I put on a camera and took it off and then put back eyepieces into it and in doing that I actually kind of loosened this housing right here that screws into the main tube and because of that there was actually a little bit of sag in the focuser and we detected this right away with venus because this is kind of a new thing i learned what we could do is we could take the eyepiece and we could pan right and left and the color on the planet didn't change at all but then when we panned up and down we saw a little bit of change in color and that was right away indicative of the fact that either the main optic wasn't calibrated properly or there was sag in the focuser. So when we turn to another object that kind of leaned the scope the other way, we noticed that that color shifting, you know, based on the relative direction that we were moving the object around the eyepiece, it also changed. And, and that, of course, you know, right away told us that the optic was perfect, it was calibrated properly, but the focuser was in fact loose. And the next morning I did find what was loose and I tightened it up. And then I did a follow-up test once again on Venus and I found no color whatsoever. I was able to pan the eyepiece to the right, to the left, up and down, and no color changes whatsoever. That was Venus, which, you know, it passed with flying colors. Now, now here's another interesting thing. We were kind of comparing the scope side by side with a very well-known brand, Takahashi. It was a 100 millimeter fluorite doublet, which it's a doublet, okay, but it's a fluorite doublet. So that's, that's pretty hard competition right there. And this guy was actually just a tinge a little bit better than the Takahashi, which is I, I thought was pretty impressive because, you know, it, Takahashi, you can't really get much better than that. Another object that I went after, and of course I wanted to see, was M13, which is a large globular cluster. And under a Bortle II sky with this scope, I was greeted with a view that was better than I've been able to see with a 14 inch Schmidt Casagrand under a Bortle V. So I was pretty impressed with it. I mean, I could see any dark patches that are in M13 and all the stars were nice little pinpoints. It didn't ever get to a blurry mass in the middle like it would with a lower end optic. So quite sharp on that end. Another test that we did, of course, was to look at the diffraction rings around the star and basically racking the focus in and out or a little bit in and a little bit past focus. Basically, the diffraction rings looked identical on both sides, which is another great test, and it definitely shows good calibration on the optics. So the way that I controlled this thing was actually using an ASI Air, and this is the new 220mm Mini, using SV Boney's 40mm scope, which has the ability to be sighted in along with the main optical tube. I, it was the first thing I did that night, was I sighted it up along with Venus, and, and actually I started with Polaris. I started sighting in with Polaris and then I moved on to Venus and fine-tuned it there. Once I got that point, I could use the plate solving software in the ASI Air to essentially point it at anything in the sky that I wanted. Now, the focuser here, this was for a camera later on, which I used later on that night. And all I do is simply loosen the set screws on the side here so that I could basically kind of override it and use the actual focuser itself. Now, how the focuser feels, it feels a lot like the other SV Bonies that I have out there. This one has just a little bit of a grittiness to it, but I think that's just maybe a little bit of over tension. I've noticed that tensioning this knob down here has kind of altered that. Uh, taking off the tension altogether makes it quite smooth. 
And now the focuser itself, there's no like uh, issues with it whatsoever that I could find. And there's no tilt in it. Even with a very heavy eyepiece in it, I put in a 30 millimeter eyepiece and it held it just fine. This, this focuser is actually similar to some of the big focusers found on scopes like the Stellar View. And so I don't think there's gonna be any questions about the build quality of that. Now, around 55 millimeters is where a lot of my eyepieces fell into focus for me. And I did do quite a bit of testing with this eyepiece right here. This is the SV Boney eight to three millimeter eyepiece. This, this was actually a pretty impressive eyepiece. I tested it against actually some Telview eyepieces and this guy kind of held up against even those. So nice little guy. I mean, it's kind of weighty. It's one of the first eyepieces that I've seen that is like an almost all stainless steel body. Now, one of the things you will need to do with this twist type zoom eyepiece is you're gonna wanna make sure that everything in the focuser is kind of tightened down because when you rotate it, sometimes it can like move things. So the finish and build of this scope is quite beefy and it is a heavier scope, 6.5 kilograms, I think, which is about 13 something pounds. But considering the size of the scope, it's actually pretty light. There are a few other scopes out there that are in this class that, you know, weigh more than this guy does. Now, of course, advancing the dew shield, I found was pretty easy. You will notice though, that I actually swapped out the Vixen plate that it came with, with a Lost Mindy plate. I think that that's kind of only gonna be necessary for those of you who want to do astrophotography with this, because you're gonna be throwing more weight on this thing. The Vixen rail that at least I think SV Boney is going to initially supply this with will be adequate for visual astronomy. Just for those of you who are doing astrophotography, you might wanna invest in either a Vixen plate like this, or perhaps SV Boney will actually ship it with one, and we'll see. Because, you know, this guy isn't out for sale yet. Now, you're probably wondering what the price is. The price at launch, I think, is gonna be $1,599. That's going to be the scope with a padded case, free shipping, and also it's going to come with the focal reducer field flattener, which is a 0 0.8 focal reducer. For, good for astrophotography. Now there will of course be a configuration that you can buy this that will be just for visual astronomy. And that one might have a different price tag, we shall see. Now this is an AM5 mount and I know I have a counterweight on here and this is actually a very small counterweight. It's only about two and a half kilograms, but really this counterweight actually isn't really necessary for a scope this size. I just kind of have it on here because there are heavier configurations that I throw on this mount pretty regularly and it doesn't harm hard to keep it on here. But yeah, those of you, if you're shopping for this scope in conjunction with an AM5, yeah, you won't need the counterweight. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, okay, what is the appeal of a scope like this for visual astronomy? Uh, it's pretty simple. Number one, to me at least, is comfort. Okay, because the eyepiece is in the back and not up at the front, like with a Newtonian or maybe a Dob, I don't know, these are just more enjoyable to observe space with. And I just use a guitar stool and I sit behind it. And the fact that I'm sitting at the scope allows me to kind of steady myself. And I feel like I just get a better view. One of the other scopes that, you know, kind of contends in this area would be a Schmidt Case Grant, of course, which also has its eyepiece in the back. But then of course there is again, just the optics. There's something about having an unobstructed field of view with no central obstruction, no weird star spikes that you have like on other types of scopes like Newtonians and so forth, that just gives you kind of a different feel. It's, it's sort of ethereal and hard to explain, but, but yeah, these scopes are really something special. And for those of you who are more advanced visual astronomers, I can see how this could definitely be appealing to you. I know several of the guys that I showed this scope to at Cherry Springs were definitely sold on getting one of them, uh, especially when I told them that the price point is going to be. There was one other thing that I did during the daytime when we were at Cherry Springs because we, we had a little more clear skies during the daytime than we did at night while I was there this year. I did some solar viewing with a broadband solar filter. And this is just something that I 3D printed, of course. I have a link to it down below so that if you have this filter, you can course clip it onto the scope and I must say that the views were nice and high contrasty I really enjoyed looking at the Sun with this thing of course it was safe <laughs> and with this particular eyepiece this is the 8 to 3 millimeter zoom that SV Boney sent me 
it's certainly a good match. Now, what kind of eyepieces might you want to consider putting in your portfolio to use with this scope? For planetary stuff, of course, this zoom right here, which I think is 150 bucks, is a pretty good combination. But you will need a bigger diagonal, okay, this right angle diagonal here, in order to go to some of the bigger eyepieces. I know I have some 20, 24, and even 30 millimeter eyepieces, which are really nice for the bigger star fields, especially some of the open clusters. And you can kind of see some of that bigger stuff with a scope like this. So those are the kind of the eyepiece that needs you'll need. Uh, this zoom right here is actually pretty good for splitting double stars, if that's kind of your thing, or going after like hot beta red stars. So hope this is kind of helpful to you and kind of gives you an idea of what to expect from this scope if you're purchasing it for visual astronomy.